over the past couple of weeks, uh, I and the team have been speaking about uh, our what we're going to call my NAS, your NAS, my NAS, but cat5.tv slash my NAS is where I'm going to put all the links for the products that we're going to be looking at. Um, the discussion has been surrounding the decision, okay, well, do we go with USB 3.0 so that we can also gain the uh, eSATA port, which is going to give us up to 6 gigabits per second, or do we go straight to uh, USB 3.1 Rev 2, which theoretically can, can give us up to 10 gigabits per second. However, the one caveat about that is that the device that we're going to be connecting it to which is an Odroid XU4 single board computer, is only capable of USB 3.0 with UASP. So that's going to be 5 gigabits per second. That's a lot of numbers to be thrown out at you. It's a lot of numbers for old Robbie to, to remember in this bald head of his, but it all makes sense to me. Uh, the decision was made, though, to go future ready and go with USB 3.1 Rev 2. So we're going to be able to access our NAS unit at 5 gigabits per second from the uh, from the Odroid XU4. But keep in mind, our connectivity to our NAS is going to be based on gigabit Ethernet anyways, because the Ethernet port on that board is, uh, is 1,000 megabits per second or whatever. So even though I can, uh, like, communicate with the drives at 5 gigabits a second, the communication then to the XU4 is only going to be 1 gigabit a second. So the theoretical uh, result of that is that the communication between the brains of our NAS is still going to be 5 times as fast as our actual throughput to uh, to and from that NAS unit itself. <clears throat> So I've got this uh, this device at cat5.tv slash uh, my NAS. And let's get a quick look at it. Now, I've put the drives, I've put two drives in here, obviously not very stably. Uh, we'll work on that in just a second. This guy just fell right out. That's okay. Uh, okay, so I've got two four terabyte drives that I've just simply plugged into the back, back plane because I was just kind of playing around with this just before the show to see how it operated. And, and, well, I didn't even really turn it on. Um, I just wanted to see that I could plug these drives in and see how they connect. So I have two four terabyte drives from my old backup unit. And the idea behind this is I'm going to be able to use this device as basically just multiple drives connected to my computer. So this is a NAS, well, not a NAS enclosure. This is a hard drive enclosure. There's a big difference when you're shopping around for these kinds of things. So keep this in mind. What we opted for, what I opted for is not a NAS unit. That's not what we want. We want a device that gives me access to these drives as external hard drives. So this has four SATA uh, backplanes. Uh, the backplane will take up to four SATA drives. And with that, um, I'm going to see four new hard drives, just like as if I plugged in a USB external hard drive on my computer. That's the theory behind it. So there's no raid happening here. There's no mirroring. There's nothing. It's just four drives connected to my Linux machine, the XU4. So then using the amazing software that comes with Linux, I'm going to be able to, I mean, because Linux is like the server OS, right? We're going to learn this week, and we've learned from the top 500 that like Linux is where it's at for servers. Um, so because they're going to be showing up as four individual SATA external hard drives, I can do whatever I want with them. So we're going to play around with mirroring, creating arrays. We're going to be checking out all the various things that we can do. But this device will take up to four drives. So we can decide how we want to segment the data across those four drives. I've just got two drives for the sake of the demonstration today. And this is what it looks like. So there we have it. And it's just simply a very basic uh, SATA backplane that gives me access to these drives. So as far as the mounting goes, there is really no, there's no drive trays or anything like, like that. There are these little plastic guys that are going to go on the front of the drive, which just gives it a little bit more pressure to push it into the backplane. Um, so these just go in like this. Drive number one. And that squeezes right into the backplane. Drive number two, 
both four terabytes just because these are pulls uh, from my uh, my old backup. Let's see here. You can see that better than I can. And there we go. Straight in there. And then this guy here is just going to go right on top. And clip in like so. I think I've almost got that. It clips in anyways. And then you close the door and you're good to go. So should we fire it up and just kind of see how this is going to um, show up on our computer? I've got my laptop here and what I'm going to do is uh, let's quickly, uh, let's zoom in first of all and do a ls slash uh, dev slash SD star. I just want to see what's there. So I only have one hard drive in my laptop and uh, that is my SDA. Let's also bring up going to zoom out here a little bit and I'm going to bring up gpartEd just so that we can get a look at what this is going to look like as far as hard drives go. So there is my SDA and that's the only hard drive available in my computer. So to power it on there's just a power button here and what I have is I've got USB 3.1 uh, USB-C to a USB um, standard a cable uh, to plug into my laptop and that is the same pardon me the same cable I'm going to use to connect it into my uh, into my XU4 now I just heard a ding on my laptop so let's see what's uh, what's going on here so in gpart ed what do we see I'm gonna go gpart ed refresh devices over here now I have two 3.64 terabyte drives is what it's showing both unallocated space that's good news. All right, over here, let's zoom in a little bit and let's run that same command. And now we see we have SDB, SDC, SDD, and SDE. Now, I imagine, see, we're seeing SDD and SDE. So understand these are drive allocations as far as how Linux segments the devices. So we've got SDA is my actual internal hard drive on my laptop. SDB is presumably the first slot in this, I, if they are sequential. SDC would be the second, SDD would be the third, and SDE would be the fourth. If I'm right, then we're going to find that we're able to, well, I mean, we can confirm that, again, by going into gparted. That's a quick way to confirm it anyways. Well, if I knew my password and entered it correctly. Yes, SDB and SDC. So SDB is going to be my first drive in the uh, in the chassis. SDC is going to be my second. So what am I going to do? Well, first of all, I want to format these XFS. So I'm going to need a couple of tools. So sudo su and log in as super user. And I'm going to go apt update move this over a little bit for you folks at home. Do I want to accept these changes? Why, yes. Yes, I do. All right. apt install xfs progs. Ah, look at that. I've already got it. Okay, so what file system would you consider for your NAS? You might think ext4. You might even think, like, maybe butterfs. Now, there's a couple of things that, um, that I would consider when I'm creating this array. First of all, um, XFS is a modern file system that has a virtually limitless number of files that I can have on my NAS, so uh, on my file system. So it's unbelievable. Like it's like to the power of, uh, we can't even count that high. Um, it allows massive amount, like massive capacity drives and it's a modern journaling file system. Now ButterFS, it's a great file system. I love ButterFS. However, I still feel like there is some concern, some worry about ButterFS with um, unexpected power loss. And sometimes that can happen. We've had power outages here in our, our local community where um, the power has been out so long that the UPS finally gives up. Um, and if that happens, I don't want to have data loss or parity issues. So XFS is able to maintain its file system much more adequately um, because ButterFS has um, uh, an issue where it can actually lose parity data if the power goes out. 
So that's something that I want to avoid in my array because if I ever lost any parity data in my array, then if a drive failed, um, then I would have problems rebuilding my data and I could potentially have some data loss. That's exactly what I want to avoid. So now that I have XFS uh, progs installed, which gives me makefs, now let's partition our drive. So, I, and notice I'm doing this in the terminal, folks. I want to do this in the terminal so that you can see um, how it's actually done. We could use the GUI, but you, I want you to be able to do this in the terminal. So FDisk, we know that it's going to be dev slash SDB. That's my first one, okay? So if I do a P, I can see that this is a four terabyte drive. See there, 3.7 terabytes. And then it's like four point blah, blah, blah bytes. It's all like rounded to 1024. Uh, so we're going to create a, a new uh, partition. Now, if you need help, just push M and enter because M stands for what? Help. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. But you see, of course, the first command that we're going to need is N for a new partition. So press N, enter. Partition number, I'm just going to hit enter, and then first sector, enter, and then last sector, enter, because I want to use the whole drive. Do you want to remove the signature? And what's that asking me? Hey, this drive already has a file system on it, and it is a encrypted CryptoLux signature, probably created with Luke's dump as you are already aware, uh, because that's my old backup. Remember I mentioned that, but I know that I have now got a new backup. So this one is redundant and not needed and redundant to the point where it can be destroyed and I'm not losing anything. So do I want to remove that signature? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to write it out with W and I'm done. So now if I do an fdisk L slash dev slash SDB, I should see that I now have SDB1, which is my first partition on SDB, the first drive in my chassis. And it is a full 3.7 terabyte and it's set up for a Linux file system. Now I can't mount it yet because there's, there is no file system. So make FS, so MKFS dot XFS because we chose the XFS file system. You could also do ext4, right? Uh, but we're going to do XFS, and I'm going to go dev sdb1. Now, one of the things that's really, really nice about XFS is the speed at which it formats the drive. This is a four terabyte drive, and I would say it's probably going to be able to format that drive like in a tenth of the time that it would take for ext4 or something similar. So, so far... I have one drive that is formatting XFS. I've partitioned it. It has a full four terabyte partition, we'll say 3.7 terabytes, and I'm formatting it with XFS using the Linux terminal. So this could be my, uh, and, and part of why I want to show you this in the terminal is because this could be my X, uh, XU4, which I could be SSH'd into, and this could be connected to the, uh, the external uh, USB. That's already finished formatting, four terabytes. Can you believe that? done. So now I could actually mount that. So if I created a mount point, so let's go slash MNT, let's make a mount point, uh, make dir in uh, MNT. I'm going to call this, I'll just call it SDB1 just for fun because it's easy to understand what that means. And I think when I was learning Linux as a, as a rookie Linux user, I think mount points were something that really confused me. And so if you've never worked with mount points before in the terminal or you're not sure how this works, um, feel free to ask questions, but I'll do my best to explain it. Um, Linux works a lot different than, say, Windows. Windows uses, like, when you plug in a drive, it's like your C drive. It's your D drive. It's your E drive. And so on. Now, Linux, you can plug in 10 drives, and none of them have a drive letter. They can just be, like, one of them can be your, your boot, and one of them can be your root, and one of them can be your home folders, one of them can be your backup, and they're all connected through the file st system structure. So in this case, I'm going to be putting that one drive on slash MNT slash SDB1. Because I created a mount point, aka a folder, at that point. But where, where it can get confusing is when I first started learning this stuff, I would, I would go into SDB1 now that I've created this folder, and I might put some files there. But then I wouldn't even realize that the drive is not currently mounted. So any files that I put there are, in fact, going on my SDA, right? the built-in hard drive on my laptop because I have not yet connected this drive to that mount point. So the way that I'm going to do that 
and and there are ways to permanently do that but to temporarily do that just to test i'm going to go mount slash dev slash sdb1 because we know that that's our first partition on that drive which we formatted xfs and then i'm going to mount that to slash mnt slash sdb1 so what i'm telling it is mount this partition sdb1 in dev to this mount point aka folder sdb1 hit enter now if i go into sdb1 it looks exactly the same however i anything i do here is actually going on the external hard drive so now if i go back one folder and i unmount that which is the command is actually u mount sdb1 now if i go back into sdb1 and do an ls look it's empty well, where'd my files go? Because right now I'm actually looking at SDA because it's not mounted. Go back again and type my mount command. Go back in. Now I am, in fact, looking at the external hard drive. So that test file that I created is on the very first drive in this NAS chassis, in our chassis, our external chassis, right there. And if it's not mounted, I won't be able to access those files. So there's one other thing that I can do which is very, very helpful because what can happen, let's unmount that, SDB1. So now it's not mounted, okay? SDB1. If I look, now what can happen is I'm going to touch test2. Okay, so now there's a file called test2. Now if I go back and I run my mount command, watch what can happen. Do you notice? Okay, so test2 is there, right? Now, go into SDB1 and do an LS, and it's test. Well, where the heck did test2 go? I've lost my file. No, I haven't, because test2 <laughs> was on SDA, because it wasn't mounted. So now I get confused. This is where I was at when I was just a rookie Linux user. Because if it wasn't mounted, or if, it, if I forgot to mount my drive, or if I didn't mount it correctly, or I, put it, I mounted it in the wrong place, I put files on the mount point unmounted, so they wouldn't end up on my external drive. So why does that matter? What if I ran a backup? What if I was backing up my SDA drive to my, X, to my SDB1, but it wasn't mounted? I would actually be copying the, dr the files from my SDA to my SDA, the same hard drive. So then that hard drive crashes, my backup is useless. Absolutely useless. So how can I fix that? Well, if I unmount that drive, so U mount SDB1, because I'm in the mount folder, go back in there, I'm gonna remove test two, and now go back, and now watch this, chatter, C-H-A-T-T-R plus I, that means Make it immutable. Make it so that it can't be written to. And then SDB1. Okay, so now if I go into SDB1 and I try again to touch test2, it says no such file or directory. What is it? Well, I know there's a file, a directory. Why can't I touch my file? Oh, I haven't mounted my directory yet. I haven't mounted my, my drive. So it's important to do that because now I can't write anything to the mount point. So now it will only work, my backup will only function if the, mount, if the drive is in fact mounted. So let's jump back here. Now that it is immutable, I can't do anything here. I can't make a directory in here. It will say operation not permitted. Go up a folder and now let's run our mount command again. So I'm pushing control R to be able to go back in my history. And now if I notice it mounted just fine. Now I'm gonna go back into SDB1 and I'm going to, now you see my test file. Let's try ta uh, touching test two. Uh, touch, I can't type and talk. <laughs> test two, there we go. So now you notice that it did work because it is mounted. All right, so this is in fact the SDB1, the external hard drive now. And uh, if you're not sure if it's mounted, watch this. Mount, it gives me a list of all the drives that are mounted. Well, that's a whole bunch of cruft. So mount pipe grep SDB1. That just gives me the one line that shows SDB1. So this shows me that dev SDB1 is mounted on slash MNT slash SDB1. Well, what happens if I unmount it and run that exact same command? No output because it's not currently mounted. So I know 
I need to mount it. Do it again. There we go. Now run that command. So what is it doing? It's, it's mount, which gives me an output of all of the mounted stuff, right? But then I'm grepping, which is basically the Linux equivalent of, hey, search that output for this, sdb1, and hit enter. And that could be anything. I could search for dev, and it will give me everything that contains the word dev. Well, no, I don't need that. I just want sdb1. And that gives me, and it's a little bit cluttered when I have it like that, but there you go. So you can see that I have dev sdb1 on mnt slash sdb1, and the type is xfs. That's my file system, and it's ready to go. So I have my first drive ready to go in my NAS. Second drive is going to be exactly the same, except we know that it is my sdc. So I'm going to go through those same steps in order to create that. Now, because this is not a RAID unit, I can put in four terabyte drives. I got my two four terabyte drives. I can also put in a one terabyte in addition to that. And I can put in a 500 gig. So I can use a mix of drives and it's gonna, each one is gonna show up as STB, SDC, SDE, D, and E. <laughs> and, uh, and then you're gonna have access to each of them. Now, with a RAID, of course, if you had uh, two four terabytes, well, you could set those up as a RAID 1, but then if you had a one terabyte and a, and a 500 gigabyte, you couldn't really connect those together and use them. Um, what we're going to be doing over the course of this series is we're going to be demonstrating how we can actually use this unit or a unit similar to this um, in order to create arrays using Linux tools that will allow me to intermix drives, to be able to create redundancy. We're going to be creating all kinds of really cool stuff so that you can understand the underlying file system idiosyncrasies. And I think even tonight you may have learned a couple of things. Please comment below. Let me know what you did learn here and, and if anything is uh, of particular interest that I've uh, spoke on tonight. And uh, and through the course of the series, we're going to be learning all kinds of things like that. The little trinkets behind the, like the, the UI that we're used to. Like we may install like a, an interface um, on our NAS unit and, and all we ever see is the web interface. Well, we're going to be working under the hood so that we understand how it all works and keeping our data safe. So that's pretty cool. Hey, we've got to take a really quick break. Uh, I'll be right back. Stick around. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Now, um, our broadcast is live, even though you're watching this on demand. We do have some questions coming in in our Discord chat. Uh, first question comes from Marshman asking, okay, how is my laptop that I'm demonstrating on connected to the NAS? Now, I mentioned it at the top of the show, but you may not have catch, uh, caught it. Uh, and I'm just going to power this off because I have unmounted it with the U-mount command. So I'm just going to hold in that power button to power off those drives so I can safely move it. There it goes. Remember that these are spinning drives. You don't want to move this while they're spinning because you can actually cause damage to the physical platters of the drive. There are needles, basically, we're going to call them. Think of an old record, right? Like a record player, LPs. Um, you've got heads that hover on a very small cushion of air over top of very sensitive magnetic platters. So if I move this while it is powered on, those platters are moving at 7,200 rotations per minute. And so if... I move it in such a way that the head touches the platter, scratch, data loss, possible hard drive failure. So I always power this off before I move it. How am I connecting it? I'm just unplugging the uh, power here. This is the back of the unit. And all I have is a USB-C cable. Okay, So that's what it is on this end. Now on the laptop end, I'm just going to unplug that here. This is the other end of that same cable. So I've got USB-C and I've got USB-A. So this allows me to plug it into a laptop or any other USB 3.0 device. So that's my Odroid XU4. That's the what we hope to achieve through the course of this, uh, this project is to actually power this from a single board computer. The reason that I've chosen the XU4 is because it supports UASP. That's USB-attached SCSI protocol, which means it's going to be able to get 
five gigabits per second data transfer to the device. Uh, unlike standard USB, it's going to be a lot faster. You're looking at a, a fair percentage more. So, so that's how I was connected. This was not an SSH connection or anything like that. This was a direct USB connection, exactly like it will be with our Odroid XU4. Reason I'm not looking at it on an Odroid XU4 tonight, and I'm actually doing this using my laptop, is strictly for the sake of the demonstration. This is a series of um, of demonstrations and projects that are going to be leading to our MyNAS. So cat5.tv slash MyNAS is where it's all going to come together. Uh, but the XU4 is going to be one of the steps in the process of creating this unit. But I wanted to show you the kind of underlying uh, way that we're going to be setting things up. And I want you to learn how some of these... Uh, these little Linux commands work in the terminal as well, because everything's going to be done in the terminal. Any other questions for us? BP9, you're very welcome. Um, the foo calling this DAS. Yes, right now in this instant, this in this instance, this is direct attach storage. Um, the idea is that we're going to be taking this DAS unit and turning it into a pseudo NAS or backup system using an XU4. So the XU4 is going to become the brains of this, and then I'm going to be able to access it as network attached storage. So I'm not going to have to plug it into my laptop. No, I'm going to be able to access it through Wi-Fi, through uh, Ethernet, and those kinds of things. Did I miss any other questions? Now, I'm watching the chat room on my phone, and so the screen is uh, comparatively small, and uh, things do tend to kind of fly by the screen. So if there are any other questions about um, the project or what I'm teaching here tonight, uh, I'm wide open. Great to see everybody here and uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, I think that that was really the, the main question. Eh? Um, BP9? Yeah, okay, so you get it now. Wondering how I was able to connect directly to the NAS unit because it's not a NAS and exactly like the Foo says, it's direct attached storage in this instance. That's all going to be changing though. And if you're not familiar with an XU4, Odroid XU4, it is a microcomputer. So think of a Raspberry Pi as a very, very small computer. Fits in my pocket right here. Uh, I wish I had it with me, but there, oh, I, I actually, if you can excuse me for one moment, I can grab one. I have one just off the set here. Here we go. So this is an Odroid XU4Q. And the Q stands for quiet because it has this massive heat sink. So this is the board that is going to power our NAS unit. So when this becomes a NAS, this is going to be the computer, the brains, that is going to power it. It's got Debian Linux, uh, Debian 10 on here uh, on a micro SD right now. It's going to be on EMMC. And then we're going to be setting up some form of mounting in order to hide this um, in such a way that it's going to be part of the uh, the unit itself. It's something that we can just put into a, uh, a room in the, you know, if you have a closet or something that you can set that up and just run an ethernet cable to this that has gigabit ethernet and that's gonna give you full access to uh, all the files and make your backups and everything else. So, all right, thanks for the questions, everybody. Um, I, I am welcome, I welcome your questions. You can email live at category5.tv if you have any more. Thank you.